Gamarjoba, and welcome to the History of Sacarvelo, Georgia. I'm your host, Roberto, and this is episode 28, Voktong and the Revenge of the Sins. In today's episode, we will deal with the aftermath of Voktong's rebellion against the Persians and his campaign to the eastern borders of Persia. And as always, a warning that we do not have much information on Voktong, so we are relying heavily on the Chronicles. As is always the case in history, everything is filtered through the biases, prejudices, and unique perspectives of the people who wrote things down. The Georgian Chronicles were not only written centuries after the events they described took place, but were created at the behest of the Bagratrioni dynasty. The information presented here will reflect the particular religious, social, economic, and political context in which they existed. In our last episode, we saw Voktong face off against the Byzantines for full control over Lazika. We also saw him fight for Kartveli independence from Persia, and the story of how Voktong became known as Voktong Gorgasali, or, in English, Voktong Wolf's Head. We're mostly calling him Voktong, as he'll be the most important person with that name for a while, but I will use Voktong and Gorgasali, or both, interchangeably. The Persian envoy arrived at the Kartveli camp and appeared before King Vakhtang Gorgasali. He prostrated himself before the king, and Vakhtang bid him arise and showered him with many gifts. Before the envoy could even speak a word, Vakhtang told him that if the Persian Shah wanted to continue the war against the Kartveli, then they would willingly die in the name of their lord, Jesus Christ, than to subjugate themselves under the fire demon Ahura Mazda, who, you will recall, is the deity of the Iranian religion of Zoroastrianism. Of course, all of this enmity between the two kings could easily end if the Shah embraced Christianity instead. The envoy returned to Shah Peroz, prostituted himself, listed out the gifts that Vatang offered, and related his plea for peace. He left out the part about the Persians converting to Christianity, as the messenger wisely felt that was, well, quite counterproductive to peace, to put it lightly. Negotiations continued via messenger for a long time, until the wise rulers finally agreed to meet in person. The Persians retreated back to Rustavi and set their camp down along the Kala Valley, for everything around Tbilisi and the Narikala fortress had been ravaged. In the meantime, Vakhtang set up camp in Jachvi, and when the time came, he set forth to meet with the Shah. In spite of his previous and quite undiplomatic suggestion that the Persians stop worshipping demons and convert to Christianity, Vakhtang had a fairly high chance of getting along with the great ruler of the Iranian Empire. Being of Persian heritage himself, Vakhtang already spoke fluent Pahlavi, which is Middle Persian, most likely wore Persian-style clothes and decorated his palaces, churches, and fortresses with Persian motifs. Now, with everyone calmed down, the rulers began negotiations with the least contentious subject imaginable, religion. Surprisingly, things went pretty well, and both agreed that the most important thing was the inviolability of their respective religions and that they would cease all interference in them. <laughs> Sure. <clears throat> ah, sorry, something in my throat. This acknowledgement led Gorgasali to invite the Shah into Tbilisi, where he presented him with gifts of slaves, cloth, and animals. This pleased the Shah, and negotiations continued to the next day. The following morning, Vakhtang arrived at the negotiating table alongside the Byzantine commander, Leon. Leon wanted to broker a peace deal between the Byzantines and the Sassanids, and told Vakhtang he was the only person for the job given his relatively positive relationship with the Shah. The Shah must have felt equally positive about the situation, because when he arrived, he told Vakhtang he would grant him one request he could not refuse. 
How convenient. Vakhtang uttered a small prayer and told the Shah that all he wanted was peace between the Byzantines and the Sassanids. Shah Peroz was taken aback. This request upset him as he believed that this was merely a ploy by the Byzantines to take advantage of the Sassanids during peacetime, especially as they were still dealing with a border dispute down in Syria. The whole reason he was fighting the Byzantines to begin with was to get the lands of Lizika back into Gorgasali's full control. Of course, that was the main reason, totally. Nevertheless, the Shah was willing to broker peace, but he would only do so in exchange for land along the border of Jazira and in Sicilia. What or where Sicilia is, is still a mystery to modern scholars. Leon bowed gratefully to both kings, and with their permission spoke to the Byzantine side of things. He offered five towns along the Jazira border and half of Sicilia in exchange for peace. Shah Peroz was hesitant, and didn't really believe Leon, but relented so long as the Byzantine Empire agreed to the conditions. Before departing Kartli, Shah Peroz left Vakhtang with gifts of spices, amber, musk, geldings, regal garments, and sables. After some time had passed, Barzaban, Peroz's mobidan, or cleric, arrived in Persia with the following message from his master. Quote, Henceforward, I promise to fulfill everything you want. Rule your country as you like. Send your representatives and take your towns, which I give you as well as to Caesar. And I order Barzaban to go to the great Caesar with the purpose of getting your lands and towns back. Though you must know that because of all I do, the Persian elders have become angry, for they expected I would ravage Greece. But instead, I granted them two kingdoms on my borders. Now, I have one request to you. Marry your sister to me, and come to visit my native land, to see your relatives, and to be an aid for me against my adversaries. The Abashas, the Elements, the Hins, and the Sins, for they dared to commit an evil deed, and they humiliated my throne. If you come, I will declare to the elders and to my Marzapans, I sanctioned love with my friends, for this was the wish of my brother, King Vakhtang. To, we gave them some lands, and but with their assistance we turned our enemies into our tributaries. In this way, we will assuage the anger of the, our elders with the Greeks. You will support me in person, but your troops you must left in place. End quote. Vakhtang sent the messenger away, and conferred with Juan Shed, his other Aristavi, and Leon on the next course of action. Leon chimed in that he would be willing to assist Vakhtang for everything he has done for Byzantium, and would lend him his troops, while he would go with Barzaban and one of Vakhtang's envoys to meet Emperor Zeno, to which the Kartveli king and his Aristavi agreed. With that, Vakhtang needed to make a number of preparations for his journey. First, in accordance with Shah Peroz's request to marry his sister, Vakhtang sent Miranduk to the Shah in Stesiphon, since her elder sister, Hwaranze, was already married to the Pityash of Somhiti. Vakhtang then crowned his son, the five-year-old Dachi, king of the Kartveli. Due to his age, a regency council of trustworthy and capable individuals was required. Vakhtang, Spaspeto Joancher, and the other Aristavi came up with the list of suitable individuals. Joancher, as the Spaspeto, became head advisor and regent, and the council would consist of other Aristavi, such as Dimitre, Grigol, Nesran, Adarnase, Samnachir, and Bakur. I just think it's nice hearing Georgian names, even if we don't hear more about them at all. Vakhtang then charged the council with the task of building the town of Ujarma on the banks of the Yori River, a location suitable for hunting and raising sheep, and to fortify it against northern raiders, such as our lovely Ossetians. To accompany him to Persia, Vakhtang chose four of his most trusted Aristavi and childhood friends named Artavas, Nazra, Bivritian, and Artavas's father, Saurmag. For his personal guard, for his personal guard, Vakhtang personally selected some of the cavalry units he had led into battle against the Persians. As for Leon, he set out for Constantinople with Vakhtang's envoy, Artavas, along with the Persian Mobidan, Barzaban. One night, Sagduk and Khwaranze entered Vakhtang's room, 
got on their knees and begged to accompany himself. They heard the king would be visiting Jerusalem and wanted to make their own pilgrimages to the Holy Land. Vakhtan granted this request as they had cared for his twin children and he could not deny a fellow Christian besides. The whole entourage then left their Antioch where they met the Shah once more. At this point, the chronicles claim Vakhtan continued on to Jerusalem and founded churches such as the Church of the Holy Cross, which we talked about for intelligence speech, but this could also be a result of the author's wish to establish him as a pilgrim. But hey, who's to say it didn't happen? Anyways, the family said their prayers in Jerusalem, gave alms, and returned to Antioch. Leon and Artavas returned from Constantinople and met Vakhtang and the Shah in Antioch, where they brought an innumerable amount of gifts for both. Included in Vakhtang's gift was a private note that read that Leon and his forces were to obey him by order of the emperor. While resting in his quarters in Antioch, the Shah proposed to Vakhtang that Sagduk and Quaranze go to his palace and be part of the celebration of his marriage to Miranduk, especially since they have faced such hardships in the past few years and needed something to liven up their spirits. After the celebrations, they could go back to Kartli immediately, or they could wait for Vakhtang in Edessa instead, partaking in the Shah's hospitality. Vakhtang accepted this gracious offer and made preparations for their journey to Stesiphon. As for Shah Piroz, he sent messengers to all his nobles to begin preparing their men for a war immediately after the marriage celebration. Now, I know what you're thinking, but it would not be a war against the Kartveli. Instead, he intended to wage war on the eastern border of the Sassanid Empire against the Hins, Sins, Abashas, and Georgians. Not our Georgians, this is Georgians with a J. When they arrived at Stesiphon, Shah Peros was officially married to Miranduk, accompanied by six months of celebration. Once the celebrations were completed, Shah Peros bestowed rich gifts upon his mother and sister-in-law and inquired if they would go back to Kartli or remain nearby in Edessa. They opted for the latter. With that, the time of love was over. Now, it was time for war. Messengers carried orders across the land, and soon the earth trembled with the footsteps of great armies. The Persian force marched east and easily seized the Georgian city of, well, Georgianeti. They massacred the population, subjugated the survivors, and assimilated the land into their empire. With the Georgians now under Sassanid control, they marched to India and spent the next three years vying for control. According to the chroniclers, the Indians had a custom of settling battles with one-on-one -on -one duels where the army of the defeated champion must retreat. Luckily for the Shah, Vakhtang was a most accomplished duelist, defeating 15 Indian champions. They successfully conquered much of the land, but frequently found themselves unable to take the many well-fortified cities due to the lack of siege equipment, so they just raided everything else. The Indian Raja soon grew wary of his people's suffering and paid Shah Peros tribute. Shah Peros happily agreed to these terms and marched his forces out of India to the land of... Sindhya. Once again, no one knows what or where Sindhya is supposed to be since we lack contemporary maps of the region. Given that the Shah had just spent three whole years ravaging the Indian subcontinent, the Sindians were well informed of the threat they faced. When the joint Persian Kartveli forces arrived at a given city and town, they were once again unprepared to overcome their considerable fortifications and armies. Many men fought on both sides, but the Sindians eventually beat the Shah back. That said, Vakhtang, Artavaz, Nazra, Vivritian, Saurmag, and Leon the Byzantine were known as distinguished combatants. They fought the Sindians on horseback and they fought them on the ground. They killed many Sindian warriors and laid waste to their infantry. Once again, the Shah's strategy of wreaking havoc until he couldn't be ignored paid off and provoked the king of the Sindians to seriously address the threat. What was once a glorified raiding campaign suddenly doubled in ferocity into a number of contentious battles. This brought back memories to the Persians of a certain wolf-headed man knowing where to attack at all times against their flanks, and they saw much of Vakhtang in the Sindian king. 
The Sindian king was a large and powerful giant, capable of killing horsemen and infantry alike with a single blow of his spear. Wherever he went, his loyal knights and infantry forces followed. Just his presence raised Sindian morale, and the majority of their battles ended in victory. More than anything, the Sindian king was undefeatable in single combat. That is, until he met Vaktang Gorgasali. One night, the Sindian king ordered his men to dig out a pit by the town's gates out of view of the Persian forces and ordered ten horsemen to hide. When morning came, he sent another horseman to the Persian camp to challenge someone to a duel. It just so happened that it was the night that Vaktang was in charge of guarding the gate. The Sindian knight challenged Vaktang to a duel, but Saramag interjected. You are not worthy to fight with a king, he said. I will fight with you, a slave with a slave. With that, he mounted his horse and pursued the Sindian knight. He chased him out of the Persian camp towards the pit. Saramag had his prey in his sights when the hidden horsemen jumped from the pit like demons of hell and gave chase. The Sindian knight turned and charged at Saramag, only to be impaled on the Kartveli nobleman's spear. He turned and violently attempted to fight off the rest of the horsemen, but even the most skilled warrior could not win against ten men. They surrounded him and impaled him until he fell. The Kartveli leadership witnessed the Sindian deception and ordered their forces to charge as quickly as they could. The Sindians th retreated into the gates, and although they pushed the horses as fast as they could, the gates closed before the Kartveli could reach it. Sindian arrows rained down and forced a retreat. Vaktang located Saurmag, dismounted his horse, and tearfully clutched his foster brother's cold body. The loss most greatly affected Saurmag's son, Artavaz. Off in a Sindian town, the king of the Sins came out and bellowed out a series of taunts to Vaktang. I will recite it below, because this is a famous parable that has been told to King Vaktang, and many Georgians will use it. Quote, King Vaktang you are like that unreasonable crow which met a wounded hawk, beaten by the eagle. Unable to fly, it was doomed to death. And the crow behaved contrary to the usual rules of crows. For when the ordinary crow sees a hawk, it begins to call loudly, informing the other crows, and the whole flock falls upon the hawk to drive it off from its nest and secure peace for themselves, for even animals understand what is in their interest. The crow did not act in this way, but took pity on that hawk. It ceased to bring up its nestlings and began collecting diligently grasshoppers and snakes for the hawk because it is not easy for a crow to obtain other food. And in such a way, it supported the hawk. When the wounds on the hawk's wings healed, it said to itself, How many days I am eating grasshoppers and snakes. I cannot regain the power of my ancestors this way, for grasshoppers do not give me the strength I need. If I could catch some bird, I would feed myself. But let me catch that crow, my benefactor. I will eat it and rest for a couple of days. When I regain strength, I will start to hunt according to the customs of my ancestors. And he did so. He caught the crow and ate it. Then it began to hunt large and fast-winged birds. And the crow gained no glory for its kindness, and they talk of it as an unreasonable suicide. Nor was the hawk censored for its ingratitude and cruelty, for such is the usage and the custom of the hawk's race. It would lose strength and die feeding on those grasshoppers, and so it behaves according to the rules and saved itself from death. The crow, on the other hand, behaved contrary to his own rules and died. The Persians, who were from the beginning, are now, and will ever be in the future, the enemies of the worshippers of the cross, are now showing love with a powerless hypocrisy. But when the time comes, there will be no mercy or fond memories on their part for the worshippers of the cross. This has happened more than once, and we know this from books. When you saw the Persians exhausted by their fight with me, you did not behave as you should. You did not rejoice and offer thanks to your god and summon other tribes and enemies to make war with the Persians and give aid to the enemies of Persia. You did nothing of the kind, but leaving your father's home, turned to the command of the great Christian army of the Greeks and toiling hard in two years became the main support of the Persians. But as soon as they recover, they will doom you and your country to destruction and eliminate a multitude of cross worshippers. This you truly bring on yourself and on the heads of the worshippers of the cross. Now, 
Why did I tell you this parable about the crow? Because you, king, sovereign and brave, voluntarily enslaved your own self to your enemy. So why should I not call you unreasonable? End quote. This resonated in Vakhtang's heart and mind, but led to an argument between the two about Christianity. I will not include this debate here, mostly because it is needless, but some parts of it do advance the action. Once the discussion between the two kings finished, we have the king of the sins say, quote, By dying in God's name, you acquire life. It means that if a man knows of his future greatness and the goods he is going to acquire, he should long to retire to the other world. Now, I understand your craving to leave this place for the other world. Come out and fight me in order to obtain your life through your death. One of your nobles has already preceded you, and now, perhaps, is preparing a shelter for you. End quote. Of course, this was anathema to Vakhtang, and would not do. A man who understood nothing of his religion was telling him how to best get to heaven, and he was making fun of his departed comrade, Saramag. Vakhtang Gyar, the king of the Sindians, quote, My death will not be to my advantage, because I am sinful and have not fulfilled all the commandments of the Lord. I have not thoroughly expiated my sins by repenting them, but Christ is powerful, and I am not afraid of death from your hand, for he is my patron, and I am securely protected by him. And the infinitely merciful Lord will kill by his absolute power his defamer through me, his humble slave, and your soul will enter into the pitch dark and into fiery hell. End quote. The provocations worked. Overcome with rage, Vaktang ordered his men to protect his rear and charged headlong into the maw of the Sindian beast. The Sindian king rode out and circled his enemy, who nimbly avoided the thrust of his spears. Vaktang retreated and his enemy pursued. Seeing an opening, the Sindian king aimed his spear at the Kartvelian's back. Suddenly, Vaktang roared around and thrust his spear clean through the king's left shoulder, knocking him to the ground. Roaring with anger, Vaktang tied the Sindian's leg to his horse and dragged him back to camp. Vaktang dragged his humiliated prisoner through the crowd of his men and before the Shah. The Persian Kartveliad lions rejoiced at the capture of such a valuable prisoner, and Vaktang received many tributes and gifts and congratulations. Never once let a hostage go to waste, the Shah instructed his doctors to save the Sindian king's life at all cost, while the Sindian prince assumed leadership of his father's kingdom. As the camp celebrated, Vaktang's rage subsided and he fell into prayer. Upon reflection, it became clear to him that the Sindian king had to be freed in order for the Persian forces to escape Sindia alive. Vaktang approached Shah Peroz and attempted to persuade him to follow this course of action, especially since controlling a territory this far away would only result in frequent and massive revolts. Instead, he suggested, we should claim what victory we can through our hostages. Shah Peroz considered this counsel and ultimately agreed. He demanded twice the tribute he placed on the Indian Raja of the Sindians, as well as the king's sons as hostages. Vaktang received part of this tribute. While the Shah continued negotiating, Vaktang spent time with the healing king, and they became fast friends. This was easy for the Sindian king because Vaktang both had mercy on him in the battlefield and counseled him that he be freed. Once Vaktang was ready to depart, the Sindian king gave him a vast amount of gifts. With the Persian troops rested up and laden with treasures, they made their way to the final destination, that of Abasheti, which the chroniclers described as a land surrounded by waters and reeds, where ships could not reach and beasts could not prowl. The Abash's borders with Persia were always changing with the fortunes of the Persian army, but this time that would change. The Shah, with no way to cross the river, ordered it diverted and the dried up reeds burned. He easily conquered Abasheti and forcibly resettled half of its natives into his own territory. Apparently, this is one of the origin stories for the Kurdish exile into the lands they occupy in the present day according to the footnote in the Chronicle. We will leave their research into whether or not that's true to someone else. And with that, the campaign to the east was complete, and Vaktang set out for his own kingdom west of Edessa. Vaktang was away for eight years, and, unsurprisingly, a slew of problems would meet him in his homeland. To see images and bibliography related to today's episode, please go to our website to check them out under the episodes page at historyofsacredvelo.com. 
It contains all the links to our social media and email contact information. Sacadvelo is spelled S-A-Q-A-R-T-V-E-L-O. I also know I haven't updated in a while, so if you really like using the website, let me know so I can actually get some energy to update it. To help this podcast continue, please feel free to subscribe to our Patreon or donate via Coffee or PayPal. The link is in the episode description and on our website. If you would like, prefer donating something a bit more tangible, we also have an Amazon wish list for you to peruse. And of course, the best way and the most free way is to help us via review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your preferred podcast host, as it goes a long way with getting the word out about the show and helping us reach new people to learn about Georgia. Madlaba da Nakhbamnis, and thank you for listening to The History of Sacadvelo, Georgia. See you next time. <laughs> Ne vadim